A Raspberry Pi is, a, is something that I guess has its genesis really in my childhood. So I was born in 1978. Uh, I had a friend, his name was Martin, uh, and he had a computer in his bedroom. Uh, and that computer was called the Acorn Electron. Now the Acorn Electron was another, like Raspberry Pi, a computer designed in Cambridge in the UK. And he could just write very simple little computer programs. So he could write that program that says, that gets you to input your name, so he could type Martin, and it would say, hello Martin, or I could type my name, Eben, and it would say, hello Eben. And that was just infuriating to me that my friend could do this thing. It just seemed like such an attractive thing to be able to do. I got a BBC Micro eventually of my own. I bought a second-hand BBC Micro and I had it in my bedroom at home. And I learned to program on it. I would program in the lunch times and the break times at school. I'd program in the evenings at home. So when I went to university, it was the most natural thing in the world for me to decide that I wanted to go to university and study computer programming. So when I arrived in Cambridge, what I found was that the uh, people I was with, my, my, uh, my uh, fellow students, uh, almost all of them had had that route into computer programming. It hadn't been a matter of learning about computing at school. We all had this hobbyist route into computing. I think what we discovered subsequently is we didn't know how lucky we were. We didn't know, um, we didn't really know where our students were coming from. We just knew we had a lot of them and that they knew what they were doing. And then things changed. By 2004, I was involved in interviewing undergraduates. I'd gone from being an undergraduate to being what we call a director of studies. And the job of the director of studies is to organise the undergraduate teaching for a subject uh, and also to go and organise that there should be more undergraduates. And I still remember going to the office, going to the tutorial office at St. John's College in Cambridge um, in the autumn of 2004. And I went to collect my folders. I went to collect each student has a folder. And I went to collect my pile of folders. And I was expecting a pile of folders like this. And what I got was a pile of folders like this. Eight or nine folders, where perhaps I might have expected 30 or 40. And what we came to over a period of a couple of years, really, it wasn't in, there was no moment of blinding insight. But over the course of a couple of years, what we came to realize was that those machines that I had, that I had, had been my way into computing, those machines that had been my fellow students' way into computing, they disappeared. You know, the BBC Micros, the Commodore 64s, the Sinclair Spectrums. What had happened? The general purpose computers as the platform for computer games had been replaced by games consoles. And this was, this was the first part of what I think has been an ongoing trend. We all carry around in our pockets today machines which are vastly more powerful, our mobile phones, machines which are vastly more powerful than the machines of the 1980s. No one ever bought a, uh, a games console, no one ever bought a mobile phone and had that be their ladder into engineering and computer programming in the same way that um, the BBC Micro was for me and for my friends. I've always described it as a hypothesis test and I think it is still a hypothesis test. And the hypothesis is if the computers went away and then our students went away, if the computers come back, maybe our students will come back. And we very quickly decided that our intervention to try to solve this problem would be that we would create a computer. Very, very early on, we settled on four things that we wanted this computer to do. We wanted it to be fun, actually. And what does fun mean? Fun means it can play games. Fun means that you can play videos on it. Fun means you can surf the web on it. But that fun should come with a frictionless opportunity to go from pure fun, pure consumption, to creation, to doing something creative yourself. So that was important to us. But what we wanted was a device that could survive the rough and tumble of being owned by a child. Finally, we wanted it to be cost-effective. We wanted it to be cheap. If you're going to ask people to go out and buy a whole special thing in order to participate in computing, it wouldn't make sense if that thing cost hundreds of pounds. We built a bunch of different prototypes. So we started off in 2006 uh, with a device which was actually barely more powerful than the machines from the 1980s. And it was a very, you know, what was attractive about that machine? It was about this size and you could build it with a soldering iron. It was built on a piece of VeraBoard. By 2008, we had a, uh, a platform uh, which ran Python. That machine also felt deficient. And the way that that machine felt deficient was that we had to do everything. If you write your own SD card drivers, your own file system, your own graphics drivers, your own text editor. Uh, and so that wasn't going to work for us. 
But by 2010, we had something that felt much more like Raspberry Pi. What was the big change? We decided we were going to build our platform around Linux. So by the start of 2012, we had something we thought we could make for the price. On the 29th of February, we made Raspberry Pi available for sale. And we sold 100,000 Raspberry Pis on the first day. Crashed both our partners' websites. Sold 100,000 on the first day. Now, that was 10 years ago. How time flies. Um, what does this mean in terms of our, um, our metric? People applying to the university at uh, Cambridge. Well, we've gone from a little over 200 people applying for a little under 100 places, so roughly a ratio of two to one, uh, to over 1,400 people last year applying to study computer science at Cambridge. It's, big, it's gone from being one of the uh, least competitive subjects to one of the most competitive subjects. So that's a wonderful thing, that single metric. There's something like a factor of 40 uh, performance difference between the Raspberry Pi 4 that we're shipping now uh, and that Raspberry Pi 1 uh, that we shipped back in 2012. And the wonderful thing is that we've been able to deliver that performance increase while holding to the same $35 price point uh, as Raspberry Pi 1. Raspberry Pi was founded with a mission to put affordable computing in the hands of people all over the world. We've made a lot of progress on that in our first 10 years. And really the dream is by the time we get to our 20th anniversary, that there will be nobody in the world who hasn't had the opportunity to have a low cost, high performance, general purpose computing experience. There we are, Raspberry Pi. Thank you very much. <laughs>